All right. For those of you that are joining us live, welcome. Uh, for those of you that are going to be listening to us in you know a later date, um, also welcome. We're excited to have you here today. Um, so we'll uh, go ahead and start the show. Are you tired of the same routine of studying the Bible? We both agree that it's time for a change. Hi, I'm Aaron, your host. And I'm Josh, also your host. Today we will be looking at um, Acts 16. And, you know, the original uh, poll that we had did not envelop all of the things that we really need to to study, you know, to get all of, all of this text into context. Uh, so we're going to be kind of... Going a little off the rails, but not bad. I wouldn't know. I don't know. What I call it going off the rails. I think it's important as you study scripture that often you need to put it into context. You need to see, like our reading started with "Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved." How do we get there? Where is this conversation coming from? Uh, and I think sometimes, you, not sometimes, always, you've got to put scripture into context. And sometimes that means going back further than you thought. Uh, or where you started, and, and to get an un- idea and an understanding of what the scripture is actually saying. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, so uh, again, today, you know, we we had plans to start at Acts 16, 31 through 40, but we're rewinding quite a bit. We're going to start at Acts 16, 16, just to give that deeper context of what was going on at that point in time. What was the importance of uh, where Paul and Silas, our, our main stars of this, uh, this story, are? And, you know, who wrote it? Who was with them? Right, and I think before we even get into to verse 16, a little background, like Paul and Silas, uh, uh, they're on Paul's second missionary journey. Uh, the first one ended with him and Barnabas. And uh, when it was time to do this, hey, let's do this again, Barnabas wanted to take his cousin John Mark along with him. Uh, Paul had... No, he wanted no part of that because John had abandoned them. So it, it ended up them. Well, I'm going to take John. Well, I'm going to take somebody else. They kind of divided, but it's, it, it God uses that. So instead of one missionary journey, there's going to be two. Uh, so Paul takes this guy Silas along with him, and um, they, they, he first Paul returns in to strengthen the churches that him and Barnabas had started in this first missionary journey. Uh, and in Lystra, he meets a young man by the name of Timothy. Uh, and he has him join the team. And uh, we see Paul, he, he wants to go into the inland. He's, he, he's around the edges of the, the province of Asia, what we call modern-day Turkey. And he wants to move inland and, and, and build the ministry there. But the Holy Spirit keeps preventing them. So he has a vision uh, uh, of a man from Macedonia saying, come come to join us here. And, uh, and along the way, they, they're in Troas. And there they, they uh, appears they, they uh, pick up a... Um, a doctor by the name of Luke, because the narrative changes from they, they, they to we. Um, so that's how they, uh, they're they going to leave the province of Asia and, and head towards Macedonia, towards the city of Philippi. So this is, this is where, you know, Paul is, he sees a vision, mm-hmm. the man of uh, the Macedonian uh, vision. Um, and, in, in his, you know, I, I guess they really weren't in Troas for that long because they were wanting to travel, but they were there long enough to all meet each other, and um, Paul has the vision, and immediately they they go. Uh, they go where uh, God wants them to go, where the Holy Spirit is leading them. So looking at this map here, you know, I'll kind of zoom out, that way everybody can see it helps contextually to know where all of this stuff happens. So, you know, for Florida, we're all the way down here. Right. So where's Philippi? Yeah, exactly. We we, we hear these places, you know, so where? Yeah. So right now, you know, you got uh, modern day Kavala, you got Philippi right here. You have uh, uh, Samothrace, which is the island that they stayed at, you know, from Troas, which I'm hoping you can see my cursor, Um, you know, first time using this, so we'll see. But zooming (laughs) in... There is where modern day Troas would be. Then they sailed up to Samothraki on the northern side. And straight through here, landing in roughly modern day Kavala. And right here is Philippi, where the, uh, the map marker is. 
So moving moving on a little bit deeper, being able to actually see, you know, the the route that they took. It's kind of cool. You know, you're you're talking about what 130 miles by sea, mm-hmm. and then you're talking eight to ten miles in a walk. So not exactly the easiest thing in the world, but you know, their their first por- uh, first portion of that journey from Troas to Samothrace was about a day. They stayed overnight, and then they made the rest of the journey uh, through into Neapolis, uh, which is modern day Kavala, roughly, and then went by foot into Philippi. And it's interesting; they didn't just stop as soon as they landed. They're in Macedonia, but but Paul goes to the major city in that area, uh, Philippi, because he knows it's easier to spread the gospel out from Philippi than to spread the gospel to the major cities. So, um, and and while they're there. Uh, the Sabbath comes, but it appears there wasn't enough of a Jewish population for a synagogue. Synagogue requires 10 Jewish males. Uh, so there was a prayer meeting going on by the river. Um, and there they meet Lydia, who becomes the first convert uh, on the continent of Europe. Just so happens to have a very large home and is a, a, a purple dye merchant, which yes. is very, very well to do. Yes. Finances wouldn't be a problem with that. <laughs> Which is ideal when you're trying to plant a church. So God knew exactly where to put them. Yeah, God has a way of just lining things up sometimes. It's weird, right? Tell me a thought. Um, so moving on, I, I guess we can really get into the Scripture reading, starting with 16. And uh, I think, you know, from there, I'm going to pop this up on the screen so you guys can view it alongside of us. So, Josh, go ahead. Sure. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer... A slave girl, having a spirit of divination, met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune-telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out and saying, These men are bondservants of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed, and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very moment. But when our masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, These men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs which is not lawful for us to accept or to observe, being Romans. The crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them, and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw that the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembled with fear as he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's a lot. Yeah. That is a lot. So we have, um, you know, the demon-possessed slave girl. There's, um, you know, some of the, the things that I was reading and studying on is that it was a young girl, you know, maybe 13 or 14 years old. Um, you know, but there's not really any, like, true information on her age. We can just only assume, right? Right. Um and that she was being used just to make money. Now, the interesting thing, and, and this is something that, that in my study I was, I was looking at, you know, demon possession, things of that nature. If, you, if you're possessed by a demon, if you look back at, you know, some of the Old Testament where God says, who knows, you know, who knows the future? Who is going to reveal it? It's going to be me. It's not going to be someone else. So did these demons uh, or the demon that possessed this girl you know, it was important to me to find out, did they know the future? Was it just purely luck, or were they just, was she just really convincing? 
Well, it says fortune telling, and, and we have a, that, that phenomenon today of, of people fortune telling, and often it's them guessing really well about yeah. what, reading people and such. Yep. And if she's demon possessed, the I mean, demons are real. The supernatural is real. They know us. They know things going around that we don't. Um, they know human nature. They they can respond to that. Uh, so it, it, she's she's fortune telling. So she might have information they don't about something. It appears that she's maybe not telling the future so much as telling people what they want to hear. And, and uh, kind of like horoscopes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much. So exactly. Yeah. The mechanics of that and how it works. It's not really super clear on, but. Right. But what she was doing, she was doing by the power of the demon that possessed her. Which the power of God was much more uh, when Paul uh, said, come on out of there, get out of her, leave her alone. Um, but, you know, with, with her following them around, I thought it was really, it was kind well, of funny. It, and, yeah, an interesting thing here, Paul, it says Paul did it in annoyance, mm-hmm. and, and she wasn't lying. The demon was telling the truth. You know, these are servants, of, uh, bond servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming you to the way of salvation. It was the exact truth. But Paul, just like Jesus, didn't want it coming from the mouth of demons. It, it, it was careful how the message and who it was associated with. Precisely, especially yes. considering the, the Roman law was that there would not be any new gods or anything like that to be introduced into um, the cities. You know, so that, that on top of that, you know, she was she was going to cause a, a bit of a ruckus if he didn't cast out that demon. Well, but apparently, casting out the demon did cause a, a bit of a ruckus, as we see here. It says her, own, you know, her owners owners weren't happy uh, when they saw this. They saw the loss of their profits. They saw uh, the, the 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 monetary gain that they were getting from her now was gone. The, 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 there was no way of, of of making the the lucrative profits they were making off of her, and it shows us that. All they cared about this girl was what they could financially gain from. And just money. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we kind of fast forward a little bit. And, you know, the, the owners of this poor slave girl are pretty ticked off. They're pretty mad. They're pretty upset at uh, uh, Paul and Silas. And they, uh, what's the best way to put it? They profile them. Based upon the way that they well, look. Yeah, and it's interesting here because it, we know Luke is there because it says it happened that as we were going to the place of prayer in verse 16. So likely all four of them were there, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and um, Luke. But they grabbed the two most obvious Jews. Right. Paul and Silas are, are full Jew- uh, Timothy is only half Jewish. Um, Luke is a Gentile. So they grabbed the two that most look like a Jew, uh, that are most different from them, the easiest to single out. Uh, and as we're going to see, that's going to be their mistake. Right. Yeah, so, uh, we're, I mean, we're talking about persecution. Um, pretty strong, immediate action. There was no delay in between um, being yelled at and then being beaten. It was pretty quick. Right, right. And they're just dragged before these authorities. The accusations are given that uh, they're throwing the city into confusion, that they're proclaiming customs that aren't lawful for us because we're good Romans, all because they're Jews. Right. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're literally, you know, being accused of being Jews. Yeah, and immediately thrown into jail, and not just into jail, they're thrown into the inner dungeon, though basically the worst of the worst. Well, no, no, you got, you got back up. They, they didn't get just thrown into the inner, inner dungeon yet. Something happened to them before that. Oh, that's true. Forgot about, well, I forgot about the rod beating. Yeah, yeah. They've got to be taught a lesson. Here you have these uh, non, uh, you've got these Jews coming in, disturbing the peace of these nice, peaceful, uh, prosperous Roman citizens, and they're bringing this confusion, they're bringing all, all this this uh, otherness to, uh, basically, he said they're saying, us good Roman citizens. Um, so they, they have to pay a price for what they're doing. Then they get thrown into prison. Yeah, but the price was they got beat with rods. <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty major Severely price. beaten, yes. So clothes ripped off and all of that other stuff. Yep. Um, one point that you had made in, in our, our private study together was that uh, each Roman citizen had a proof of citizenship that they would keep on their body. Is that, that, that correct? Uh, yes, yeah, so it would be like a proof of birth or, or birth certificate, yes. And you would probably keep that in or on or near your inner garments if you needed to pull that card? Yes, it would be something that would be pretty uh, important to be able to prove. Uh, because if you claim to be a Roman citizen and you're not, that can lead to death. And uh, they couldn't produce any form of credentials because they were stripped down to their undergarments. Um, but also, 
you know, like Josh and I were talking about, the Holy Spirit had to have been playing a role here, had to have been, um, in, in keeping them silent of saying, hey, we're Roman citizens. That'll come later. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to pull up um, you know, kind of the, the, the major points of this persecution. We're looking at helping the innocent. You can be persecuted for that. Uh, Paul and Silas were. You can be profiled for how you look, which, again, we, we already touched on that. Yeah, the, part of the accusation was these are Jews. Yeah. They're different than us. You have unfair treatment compared to your peers. I mean, Luke and, and Timothy were traveling with them. They're you know relatively close friends, I would assume, uh, brothers in Christ. And you're getting treated terribly compared to the other two travelers that you have with you. Having your rights taken, you know, as a as a citizen, you have certain rights. You have rights to a trial in Rome before you or in any Roman colony uh, before you get any kind of punishment. Correct. Correct. Yes. Before they were beaten, there should have been a trial, uh, but that only pertained to Roman citizens. And the assumption was made that because these men were Jews, they weren't Roman citizens. So therefore, those did not apply to them. They weren't. Uh, applicable here, they were at the mercy, and um, they basically at the, at the mercy of the whim of the magistrates and the the crowd. They could literally do whatever they wanted to with them. And then, lastly, uh, well, not lastly, you have the pain and torture while a mob cheers. Uh, we saw that with Jesus during you know his his crucifixion. People were cheering it on as he was being beaten and spit on. Um, now we have Paul and Silas being beaten with rods. And there is no, you know, 40 less 1 or, or 39. No, that was actually a, a Jewish law. Mm-hmm. So they didn't, they didn't have that limitation. There is nothing here that says that they were beaten with more or with less. It just simply says, Luke says, many blows. Well, and I'm sorry, the 39, the 40 less 1, was a Roman law in regards to flogging. Um, when somebody would be put to death, and like as in the case of Jesus, they could be flogged because it would hasten the death and make it come quicker but only 39 because if you went much further, they might die before they got on a cross. Right. So there, there was a Roman application to that. But your point there about uh, pain and torture while a mob cheers, and if we think about that, here are two men who all they did was deliver this woman. I mean, two, the four of them, but Paul is the one who delivers her. Because think about this. If she's demon-possessed, what is that like for her life? How is that making things more difficult? What is it? He's bringing this this freedom to her through Jesus, and now it turns into they're being beat for it, and the crowd is cheering it. And, you know, we look at that, and we just we would almost come up with like despair, like where's God when this is happening? How are you know they're being downtrodden, they're being put down for this, and, and all they did was the right thing, and the crowd cheers it, and and we almost want to just feel despair. We want to feel, if we put ourselves in their shoes and we have empathy, we want to think, woe is me. How can things get worse? And this is you hopeless. Know? Yeah, we're doing the right thing. We're start, you know, we, we've come to this place that we've been called to. We're, we're trying to spread the gospel. We, we, we started to get a foothold here. We, we freed this girl, and now we're beat, and we're, we're in stocks, and it, things just can't get worse. But that wasn't their attitude at all, was it? No, not at all. Uh, which then follows on to wrongful imprisonment, which is exactly what happened to them. Yeah. Yeah, there, there, there was no reason for them to be in prison. Uh, and as Roman citizens, they shouldn't have been thrown in prison again without a trial and the, with this beating. And, but, but when we find them in prison, what do we, what, what do we see them doing? <laughs> that is the, uh, that's the very interesting thing. So, you know, when they're, when they're in prison, what are they doing? They're praying and singing. Witnessing to others. And I love this. It says at midnight. So it had been a long night for them. They're they're obviously in pain. Yep. Uh, And and the idea of stocks was they didn't just have two holes like, you know, we see when you you go to Disney World and you stick your head in there and all that. It was the idea there was multiple holes where they could spread the legs further apart and cause pain. And I'm going to just guess from the way things went they were probably in the widest setting. They were, they were probably in something that caused them discomfort and pain. So sleeping probably wasn't an option for them, and they realized that. And now at about midnight, they're praising God. Yeah. And they're singing hymns. 
the calm in the eye of the storm, which is one of the notes that we had here. Yeah. And, uh, and you, I think we missed your middle point there. And I think that's really important as we see this story unfolds, witnessing to others. The other prisoners were watching them, seeing how they reacted. They, they know what happened to them. They, they've seen them come and beaten. They've seen them in the stocks. And they see that these guys are praising God. They're worshiping God. They're singing hymns. There's a joy to them in this circumstance that should be so wrong. It's so messed up. There's... You know, this isn't how it's supposed to go. This isn't. This is the opposite of a happy story, and and they have joy in the midst of that. Yeah, and just imagine being a prisoner, also there with them, thinking, "My goodness, we're all in a miserable circumstance right now. We don't know what's going to happen to us tomorrow." And we got these dummies over here just singing and and praying to who? Who is this that they're singing and praying to? And they're learning. They're feeling the emotion. They're they're understanding by a really amazing example how they should also be. Yeah, and I think there was a, an impact on those prisoners as we're going to see when the earthquake comes. We, we see their reaction. Uh, I think they were having an impact on these guys, and these guys were saying, hey, what these guys have, I want that too. You know, if they can be joyful in the midst of this, they're praising God, and then all of a sudden an earthquake comes. And what happens? Well, first of all, I'm going to say this um, This definitely appears to be that it was a miraculous earthquake. I mean, you look at the description. All the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. Uh, that's not the usual circumstances in an earthquake. I mean, the chains might come undone, the doors might open, but the building's going to be destroyed and the people are going to be dead. But it appears everyone's alive, their chains fall off, the doors open, boom, we have freedom. Yeah, freed from bondage, free to escape their imprisonment, realizing the bondage of others and sin. Uh, your point just a moment ago about, you know, the other prisoners had to have had to have felt something, some form of emotion to keep them sitting there. Also, it wasn't just the amazing earthquake that freed them. It could have and most likely was them beginning to understand that God is in control of everything at that point in time. Because had I been in there, I honestly think that I probably would have gotten up and ran away. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's yeah, me. And, and, you, and you think, what kept them? What kept them from, from running away? Why didn't they run away? Why did they stay? And I think they're following the lead of Paul and Silas. Here are these guys praying to God, praising God, singing hymns, an earthquake comes, everyone's free, and they're still the center of attention. I think everyone's following their lead. Okay, what are these guys going to do? Yeah, uh, They're praising God, they're praying, and then the earthquake comes. I'm following them, whatever they're doing. And they stayed put. Yeah. And my, my note here, you know, the hardened Roman soldier, the jailer, uh, which we, we talked about a little bit, you know, prior to the show, um, could have been a hardened soldier, could have also been a, a civil servant. Well, it could have been both because Philippi is a uh, retirement area for soldiers. So right. it, him being a city official, there's, there's a good chance he was retired Roman soldier also at that. So it, both would fit with that. And... Uh, when he sees this, he sees the, the doors open, chains off. He prepares to kill himself because he knows that the, the penalty for those prisoners now passes to him. But also he looks and he sees this jail full of men that are free now. And I think maybe he might have feared what they were going to do to him. That's very possible. Uh, think, that would be going through my mind. I think he's thinking, you know, a, a quick death by my hand is preferable to what these guys are going to do to me. And if those guys don't do anything to me, then the magistrates are going to put me to death or punish me in some way similar to what the uh, prisoner's punishment was going to be. Right, right. And uh, so when he, when he sees this, that's what leads us. He falls down at their feet and says, What must I do? What must I do to be saved? And that sets us up for Acts 16.31. They, they dive into it. That gives us the circumstances. That gives us an understanding of what's happening. How do we get to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Yep. Now we see this, where he's come to that point. What must I do? Because he sees what they have, and just like the other prisoners, he's thinking, I want that. And that's why it's important. Uh, you look at the bottom point here, calling to the lost. You, you can't call to the lost if you yourself are viewed as lost. If you're... Um, if you're not in study, if you're not following, you know, the word of God, if you're not praying and hopeful, even in your worst situations, it's very difficult to call other people that might be going through something worse to, to come to Christ. Right. So, I mean, you're seeing, uh, calling to the lost is, is an incredible thing. Right. 
So moving on, I, I guess, over to uh, Acts 16.31. Go ahead. Okay, so Acts 16.31 to 34. Uh, in my notes, I have it titled, That Night. These are the events of that night. They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke, spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them at that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. That's um, pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. Pretty amazing. So and we see Paul's response here in this situation uh, is a statement of the essence of the gospel. This is salvation by grace alone, received by faith alone. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Pretty simplistic. Yeah, yeah. Pretty. You know, he didn't direct the, counsel, the, the, the jailer to a counselor. He didn't lecture him on proper theology. He didn't make sure that he got all of his spiritual terminology correct. He pointed him to faith in Jesus. You've you've got a, a person quite literally about to like off themselves. I don't know what we can say on Facebook Live without getting um, locked down, but he was about to off himself in, in a very nasty manner, mm-hmm. and they essentially convert him with just one simple sentence, or it could be two. You could comma it, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, believe, and you will can't get much simpler than that. No, no. In here, um, some make a big deal that Paul did not call the jailer to repentance. He just says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. There's no call. Repent. Uh, Jesus often said, you know, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. So Paul's doctrine is differently. But uh, he didn't do this because the jailer was already repenting. Look here. He says, he was trembling with fear. He fell down before Paul and Silas. That's an attitude of, of repentance already. He, Absolutely. He's already turning from his ways. And, you know, to put your faith in Jesus and to choose to follow him, because that, that, that's where the, the word believe here is to put your faith in, to trust. In fact, the word faith comes from this Greek word belief. Um, when we truly follow Jesus as Lord, we will repent and turn from our sins. That, that's, and when we make Jesus Lord, when we put our faith in him, when we trust in him, repentance is what we're going to do. Or we didn't believe in him. We didn't put our faith in him. It, it's a natural occurrence. Yes. One yeah. right after the other. Mm-hmm. It just happens. Anything more than that or asking anything more of that is discounting what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Yes. And uh, I, that's not good. Um, going on to then salvation. You know, Knowing the gospel gives strength in dire situations. Uh, you have to be able to understand the gospel also to witness to other people and teach them the way of God. Right here, and I think understanding the gospel, it was real simple. Paul's answer was, believe in Jesus, and you will be saved. Right. Put your trust in him, put your faith in him, and you will be saved. Uh, it, it's a pretty simple message. You you put your faith, you put your trust in him. All the, the baggage that follows... Uh, that wasn't required at the moment of salvation. It was you know, trust in God. You, you've seen what he can do. Now believe in him. Right. And you have to be willing to answer the call. Yes. Which is case in point for being able to witness to somebody, <laughs> you know, properly. You have to be willing to stand up and, and tell someone it's all going to be okay. All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is have faith. Um, going on to putting yourself aside. You had these, these two men that were in stocks as you described, you know, legs spread wide open. I know I can't do the splits. Um, They've been whipped uh, or beaten with rods, sorry, and uh, super uncomfortable, um, sore, bruised, and they put themselves aside. They didn't get up and start running away. No, their most important goal that night was to praise God, to recognize God's authority and wisdom. And it allows you to bring others to redemption. Yes. And, and, and another note on this, the verse, uh, you and your household. Uh, this appears to be a specific promise to the, Philipp- the Philippian jailer. The household of the jailer was not 
saved because he was. I mean, look here what it says they did. Uh, they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. They were saved because they trusted the word of the Lord spoken to them that night. They, they put their faith and in, in, in belief in Jesus after they heard the gospel. Um, and you notice, too, is uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ is, is how it started, but then they took him and his household, and they... Uh, they spoke the word of the Lord. They presented the gospel. They didn't just say, believe in Jesus, make Jesus Lord. They, they presented the gospel to him, the word of the Lord, what God was doing uh, at the cross, the, the whole gospel message. And then it says, he took them that very hour in verse 33 of the night and washed their wounds. So the same jailer who punished them, uh, it's at least by placing him in the stocks. He might have been involved with beating them, but he was definitely the one who put them in the stocks that night and was keeping an eye on them. But now we see he cares for them. He washes their wounds. And in verse 34, he sets food before them. And what we see here is this shows his repentance, his turning away. Right. Um, he was the one that was causing them discomfort, but now he's trying to bring comfort to them. Uh, he's following the example of love shown by Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas, when they were free, they could have just taken advantage of that. They could have run away. They could have led a rebellion. They could have freed. Look at the power of God. Man has tried to hold us back, but God has set us free. But instead... They thought of the life of that one Philippian jailer was more important than them running free. It's beautiful. Yeah. All right. So now I'm, I guess we can move on to 35 through 40, which is... Well, well, first of all, we see that immediately he was baptized. He and his household, they put their faith in God. They put that, that uh, public uh, acknowledgement of Jesus as Lord. They, they make that example. So now the church now has a whole new family Right. Before, it was just the Lydia and those who were worshiping with her. Now we see a whole family coming to join the church, being baptized. And then we see rejoicing greatly. So what began as a bad day for Paul and Silas and became an even worse night for the jailer became a night of joy for all. The, the, jailer, yeah, the jailer went from suicidal to abounding joy in a short time. So the Holy Spirit used the courageous praise of Paul and Silas in the time of adversity, to bring joy to the jailer and his household, as well as themselves. Yeah, and ultimately led ultimately led to the birth of, you know, the first church in in Europe. Yeah, this is this is the first church. Of the, these are some of the first converts on the continent of Europe. Yes. So looking on to so now let's go on to the next day. That'll be verses thirty-five to forty. Moving on. So that's what happened that night. But what happened the next day? Now, when day came, the chief magistrate sent their policemen, saying, Release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us in public, without trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison. And now are they sending us away secretly? No, indeed. But let them come themselves and bring us out. The policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and appealed to them. And when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. When they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and they departed. So the next day, we see the chief magistrate sent their policeman. Now, I was kind of interested because that's not usually a word we find <laughs> in the Bible, policeman. Um, when we were doing the live reading, I was like, policeman, really? really? It said, yeah, it says policeman. <laughs> so policeman is literally, this is interesting, literally it means have a rod. So this was an official who beat people with rods to maintain law and order. Sound familiar? Yes, it does. Yeah, these... Uh, they worked for the, the magistrates and they administered uh, punishment to keep law and order in the Roman cities and provinces and colonies, as we see here. So very likely, these are the very men who beat Paul and Silas. And now they're coming to set them free. They're going to release those men. So Paul and Silas, they had been arrested. They had been beaten. They had been imprisoned. And now they were unexpectedly being released from jail. Now, this is the sort of treatment that you use uh, to effectively terrorize a population into submission. Right. Everyone's wondering who is next, if they can do this. They can just take you, they can beat you, they imprison you, and then they let you go the next day. Or you languish in jail for a while. So 
an effective tool for keeping the population submitted uh, using terror. But this is uh, a situation that Paul and Silas, they do not want to leave the growing church in Philippi in this situation. If only there was something they could do. And it's, it's funny, you look at uh, the magistrates, there's probably some fear of being punished themselves because they cast judgment on some, you know, group of, or two gentlemen mm-hmm. um, and had them publicly beaten. And then there's also the fear that if they are seen um, releasing Paul and Silas themselves, then at that point, anybody from the outside could just come in at any point in time, rouse up a ruckus, and that'd just be the end of it. You know, that you can literally do whatever you want. Law and order has gone out the window. So they've got two different, like, feelings of, oh, no, we're in danger at this point in time. And, and also them coming to do it personally would be admitting they were wrong. Yeah. They, that's what they definitely don't want to do in this situation. They don't want to admit that they were at fault. They messed up in any way. Um. You know, and like the jailer says, come out now and go in peace. He, he thinks he's bringing good news to his new friends. Um, and, and here we also see if, if Paul and Silas were to be released the next morning, and this isn't news to God, he obviously knew that. Right. So they've already been beaten. So the physical, the physical punishment or pain has already come. Uh, they've been in stocks all night, at least to midnight at this point when the earthquake comes. If they're going to be released in the morning, like, you know, just go in peace, it's all over, it's done with, why'd God send an earthquake? <laughs> exactly. As we see clearly, the earthquake wasn't to bring freedom to Paul and Silas, but to get the attention of a jailer. Yeah. And uh, ultimately, you know, when you're being persecuted, when things are going wrong for you and you know that it's unjust, God's justice is always going to come. And here we'll see it uh, as we study in. You know, it's a, it's a result of wearing the armor of God. Uh, Ephesians 6, 10 through 17 says that you wear the whole armor of God, and that's the natural result. Um, and it's the eventual deliverance of God's people against injustice. And we see that plain and clear here. There was justice, um, but Paul and Silas weren't, I would assume that they, they weren't proud of uh, being able to say, you know, no, 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 have them send us out. They were more or less saying, no, justice will out. You, the people that persecuted us, you're going to be the same ones that free us. You, you know, and to build off your point there about the, the whole armor of God, if we look at this and we look at their, their lives here, we see the, the gospel of peace. Uh, that's what they were, they were there for. We see faith uh, as they're sitting in the prison. They're facing this horrible times. Uh, their faith is what sustains them through that. We see the helmet of salvation. They're sure of what God is going to do. We, we, we see those pieces of the armor. I mean, Paul might, might not have completed that thought yet, but we see that working out uh, to, to bring about God's justice, to bring about what God's going to do in this, this situation uh, instead of what they see from a human perspective, but what they can see from God's perspective, what, what, what he's gonna, relying on what he's going to do, and here are the tools he gave us to do that. Right. And we're, you know, as Christians, you know, we, we have this false sense of we need to be um, weak and beaten and battered um, obviously, you know, we're tested and trialed and all of that. Um, but we don't have to just sit down and, and take the, the beating. You know, we have armor. We have the word of God. We have the sword. Um, now, it's interesting when you say we don't have to sit there and take the beating. You're, you're talking about from a physical point of view, correctly? Because they did take the beating <laughs> physically. They, they did. And that was part about bringing about what God wanted Oh, that's true. Here, because uh, Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, and and they did have rights, yeah. rights which the magistrates had violated. Well, that's a good point. And uh, now that brings up why didn't Paul and Silas reveal their citizen citizenship earlier and avoid the pain? They they could have said something, but they kept their mouths shut. Right. So why do you think that was? Personally, after reading this many many times, I I think Holy Spirit inspiration kept them from speaking out because Paul and Silas at that point, I'm relatively sure that they didn't know that they were going to be creating 
the first church in Europe. They had an idea that they were going to Macedonia based on a vision of a man saying, please come help us. But, I mean, you're, you're having your clothes stripped off and you've got a bunch of guys standing around with rods in their hands. You're probably not thinking about the future. You're thinking about, oh no, what's, like, what's happening in this immediate future? What's about to happen next? You're not thinking 20 steps ahead. So I would say Holy Spirit inspiration. Right, we see calm. We see that a lot when you look through commentaries and such. That the, maybe the Holy Spirit kept them from revealing it. Uh, we've seen earlier in this mission, this missionary journey, that the Holy Spirit has held them back from doing things that they, they thought they wanted to do. But it never tells us how the Holy Spirit did that. And, and here, if that happened, it doesn't tell us how. But you know, but maybe like getting into the, maybe they didn't have an opportunity. Maybe it happened all so fast that. Before they knew it, they were beaten and they're in jail. The next thing they know, in jail. Sometimes uh, things will happen to us. And they happen just so fast, boom, 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 that before we realize it, we look back and, but I could have done this and I could have done this and I could have just said something and stopped it. But in the moment, it, the opportunity is just not there because it happened so fast. That's know? a really good point. I've won a lot of arguments in the shower. And yeah, 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 I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm literally yeah. the only person in the shower, and You're I'm undefeated. arguing. Yeah, yeah I am unde- Well, You're undefeated no. against yourself. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you try to put it in an application, <laughs> it never quite goes the way you think. No, never. You know, and, and we look at this, This they're brought before the magistrates, the crowd gets in it, they're ordered, all of this, and, and maybe they didn't have access to their proof, but maybe in, in all that mayhem, there just wasn't an opportunity to bring it up. Maybe... It's just sometimes life comes at us so fast and so hard. It's easy to think, well, I would have done this. I would have done that. But in the moment, it's just the next thing you know, they're beating you. And they're not really listening to what you're saying anymore. Right. When the rods are out, they've gone too far. You know, you know, there's no stopping it. So they're not really listening to what you're saying. It's very, you know? very difficult to calm down a belligerent person. Because at that point, belligerents, they've gone, they've gone too far. Yeah, and another point to bring out here too is our rights are not as important as our obedience to God. Correct. Now here they laid down their rights, whether voluntarily or involuntarily. You know, whether whether it was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and they just kept their mouth shut, or there just wasn't an opportunity because the circumstances just went so fast. But they did it for the good of another, and, and actually the good of a, of a family. You right. know, a family comes to know Jesus because of this. So God used their rights being violated so that they would have an opportunity to share the gospel with someone they likely never would have met otherwise. The, 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 they probably never would have met the jailer, never met his family. He would have never listened. And they probably never would have met the prisoners inside that prison. Right. Because we don't know if any of them got saved or not. But I'd like to think that they became members. You know, well, that, I mean, with the testimony started. of the jailer and the earthquake, <laughs> I would say it's it's likely other the, some of those prisoners they didn't run away. So Paul and Silas had some kind of impact on them. So any of the ones that were going to live that were not, you know, to be punished with death. I'm, well, even the ones punished by death, what better time to come to know Jesus, right? Um, amen to that, because we look at the thief on the cross. Yeah. Well, at least one of them. Yeah. Um, and and that brings me, you know, to. To my next point here, which is the truth of who Jesus is, which is uh, portrayed very, very well by Paul and Silas both, where um, even in even in a time of, of agony and pain, they still looked after someone who, at, up until that point, was lost. Yeah. Um, you, you you think about uh, you know as, as we're as we're growing up. You know, we're taught that Jesus is, is soft and kind and tender, and of course he is, mm-hmm. but he is half lamb, half lion. You know, he's soft to those that he loves and that love him, and he's terrifying to those that do not. And if you disagree with me, I, I beg that you'd open up Revelation and read a little bit of that. Well, but even on that soft part, lamb part to those he loves, in the Hebrews it talks about uh, not sparing the rod, to those he loves. So when we mess up, part of his love can seem like tough love at sometimes. All right. Yeah. We're, you know, but we're, but that's that's him, that that to him looking for our correction to get us back into a right relationship with him. Yeah. How do you harden a clay pot that you've designed as you throw it through the fire? Yeah. Um, going over to a couple of the last points that I had, um, it's justice is created and dispensed by God, which is very important, especially when you're feeling like. 
you are alone, you are wronged, everything in life is against you, that the justice will come. We just don't know when, and we don't need to worry about dispensing it ourselves. Right. We and need it, to worry about praying yeah, to God. Yeah, it, because it often doesn't come how we think it should right? or what is proper. But in the long run, like Paul and Silas here, that jailer wouldn't have been saved if this didn't happen to them. You know, and the justice is, well, what happened with these chief magistrates? It says they kept begging them to leave the city. So these guys are going to get away with it? You know, they, they beat Paul and Silas. They violated the law clearly. And now they just get away with it, you know? Yeah. They, they want the problem to just go away. They want the matter swept under the rug. They want Paul and Silas gone. But Paul had other ideas. Yeah, they wanted all the trouble to go away. Mm-hmm. And uh, ultimately, you know, the justice is backed by the power of God. And the God that formed everything that we see in front of us, um, if we trust in him to dispense justice, if we trust in him to, to take care of us and um, you know, guide us down the right path, then you know, it's, it's pretty easy to understand how strong and how powerful God is. And the fact that justice is backed by his power is, is incredible. Um, he's, a, he's the creator of justice and gives us rights as his adopted sons and daughters. That doesn't mean to say that, you know, you're going to have an easy life or everything is going to be incredible for you. You're going to be beaten. You're going to be uh, mistreated. You're going to be yelled at. You're going to be ignored um, by even, you know, some members of your own family just for following Christ. But at the end, justice will prevail. Yeah, and we look here as as how God... Administered his justice, how he, what he brought about in this situation. I'll look at in verse 40. When they saw the brethren, they encouraged them. So when this condition was met, they agreed to leave. They didn't just leave straight from the jailer's house or from the, from the prison straight out of town. Nope. They went back to Lydia's house. They met the brethren. They met the new believers. They encouraged them. Uh, they weren't going to be rushed out of town. Right. Uh, first, they wanted to bring their ministry in Philippi to a close. God had called them there for a reason. They had done something. But they weren't going to be just run out of town because these guys had wronged them, so not, they can't just force them out of town. Uh, and then it says they departed. So once they made that, that, everyone sees them leave the prison. They see the magistrates come down and beg them to leave. They see them go to the house of Lydia, and then they see them depart. Now you said they depart. Oh, yeah. See, in the short time in Philippi, Paul and Silas left some notable people behind. First, obviously, being Lydia. Lydia being the the first convert here on the continent of Europe, um, she was a worshiper of God before they came. They they found her uh, at a prayer meeting down by the river, uh, worshiping God. So she was open to God, and and so they shared Jesus with her. And she goes from being a follower of the Father to a follower of the Son. Uh, she talked about she was a successful businesswoman. She dealt in in, in purple dye, which was a, a pretty uh, lucrative. Um, business to be in, so yeah. and she knows what she's doing. So she's not just uh, she's not the poor, she's not the, the the slave girl that had the, the demon cast out of her. But this is a successful businesswoman in life, uh, and she's a host for the church. She's got a house. She begged them to come and stay with her. Uh, so that now the church has a foundation, a place to meet, and then they left the jailer behind, um, who no indication that he believed in any way before they came. Right. Uh, he's uniquely placed to share Jesus with those who need him. As the jailer, he's got people coming right through. And you don't? Do you think? Do you think there's any way that jailer didn't share Jesus with people in his jail? Talk about starting a prison ministry. Yeah, that was that's your first prison ministry right there, probably. <laughs> Pretty uh, stinking and close. And the jailer is also in a place where he can keep an eye on the church and the city officials, making sure there's no interference here. And because he's also a Roman, he's able to speak to other Romans. Yep, he knows As the truth. He, he knows the truth of what happened with these magistrates and Paul and Silas, so nobody's going to mess with that church because he, he can keep out. And then also it appears that they left Luke behind. Uh, the language switches back to they departed. Right uh, when it speaks of them leaving, so Paul and Silas have to leave because of the commotion. They take Timothy with them, but they leave behind the man who will write more of the New Testament than anyone else. Like, oh, well, Luke, he just kind of joined the story. 
Luke, get this, he writes more of the New Testament than anyone, even Paul himself. I, I got hung up on they were beaten with many blows because it was written by Luke. And if you look at Luke's accounting of, of everything, it's really surgical, no pun intended. I mean, he was a doctor. But he almost always names numbers. I, I was, I'm going to say here there's probably some PTSD involved. Yep. He was probably there as part of the crowd. He probably witnessed it. But he's... There's a point when when it's shocking this happened. This is what was it? you just watched God deliver this slave girl. You know, with the power of Jesus, a, a demon comes out of her. She's delivered, and now they're beating Paul and Silas. This isn't how it's supposed to go. So he he might have lost count of numbers. Well, so the, he just knew it was a bunch, right? And the the beauty of uh, divine inspiration for um, you know everybody that that had a hand in writing you know the sacred text. Um, if it were written by a man with a man's uh, viewpoint, they would have named the amount of times. They would have described everything about it. But those things ultimately weren't important to the story. The important thing was that they ended up having their rights taken, get thrown into jail, and find a, a person who has no... Um, respect for his life, I guess is the best. I'm trying to dance around the word that I'm, I don't want to use uh, just in case Facebook comes and slaps us. But um, I, I think I might have said it once. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you, you got a guy that's, that's horribly down on his luck and he's now going most likely to become a integral part of the church mm-hmm. in Philippi, which is, is fantastic. So, you, you look at divine inspiration and, you know, the writing of the text and how we would all kind of elaborate on certain things if we were to be the ones writing it. And that, to me, just gives more validity to the text and its um, authenticity, I guess yeah. is the best way to put it. Mm-hmm. Um, so looking at uh, essentially the, the ideas, you know, behind what we're looking at, which is, you know, we've talked about persecution about praise, about freedom, salvation, and justice. Um, persecution, they were, just, they were just Jews in, in, a, in a Roman city, and they get pulled aside. Um, praise in light of terrible conditions, you know, torturous conditions. Mm-hmm. Uh, the freedom, the uh, divine earthquake that breaks the, the prison down. It doesn't break down the walls, obviously, because they're able to walk away from there. Uh, but it breaks down what but, was imprisoning them. But it wasn't their freedom. Well, that's true, too. Uh, <laughs> it was freedom for the jailer. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the gospel is preached. A hardened man is converted, and a church is established. And lastly, justice, which is God never forsakes his people. Uh, the church at Philippi is now protected, which uh, that last bit, the church at Philippi is now protected, that came from your notes, Josh, which is pretty amazing and something that I wasn't even thinking about at that point in time is now they have protection from uh, people like the magistrates coming in and, and causing a ruckus. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Well, not only that, it's, it's, it's not just that. The magistrates probably are going to take a little look out to this church to make sure other people don't come in and mess with them because they want to make sure that the friends of Paul and Silas Stay friendly. Talk you know, about in other sweeping words, under the rug, you know. Right, right. Their, their, their corruption, God is going to use to protect his church here, uh, at least for a time. At least for a time. Now, when the magistrates change and all of that, persecution is going to come in the church of Philippi. Um, and so how do we apply this text to our life? How do we take these things we look at, and, and how do we apply them to our lives? And we can see that obedience to God is more important than our rights. And, you know, sometimes as an American, that's kind of hard to, to say out loud, but that's true. We're, we're very protective of our rights. We, we, we we're very appreciative of our rights. Uh, we look at our rights as being given to us by God, and that's the key. Right. So obedience to God is more important than our rights that God gave us. Um, and then others are watching us in our difficult times, and our witness can affect them. Uh, we see this with... Paul and Silas in the prison, first with the prisoners. The rest of them don't run away. Paul and Silas had to have made an impact on those guys to keep them in their cells. Otherwise, they're telling the jailer, well, the two of us are here, everyone else left, but we're hanging around, buddy. We're here for you. 
But being they didn't leave, their, their, their witness affected them. And obviously, it affects the jailer and his family, and they come to know Christ. And then God can take our messed up circumstances, being beaten with rods, being thrown in prison, surviving an earthquake, and he can turn them to joy if we obey. Paul and Silas were obedient to God, and God turned that to joy, not just for them, but for the jailer and his family. Multitudes of souls were saved at that point in time that otherwise wouldn't have been. Um, Alexander, a friend of the show, I was uh, at dinner with him, uh, with my wife and kids, and uh, the first words out of his mouth to the waiter was, do you have anything that uh, you would want us to pray over with you? And, And he does do this at dinner very often. Yeah, he just... Great testimony. Blurts, I mean, yeah. a, a great way to share with somebody. Just blurts you know, it is, out. Is there something we can pray for you? And you know what? He almost every time I've seen him do this, because he, he always gets an answer. Yeah, and this I, time, you know, this time the the, the gentleman, um, you know, he kind of shied away. But I think it was mainly because it, it just took him by surprise. You know, mm-hmm. we're not used to as as humans of any kind of uh, religious background or belief system. We're not used to somebody just openly saying, "Hey, I care enough about you to ask you." If I can pray for you, right. um, you know, Josh, you do that. Uh, I've had some of my clients actually um, where, you know, we pray together on the odd occasion. And it's, it's beautiful, but something is as strong as that to something as simple as, you know, stubbing your toe at Publix and not saying a bad word. Um, well, in, in back, asking someone if you can pray for them is a whole lot easier than staying in the cell when the chains come off. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, we're going to assume the stock's broke too. I would hope so. Yeah. That would make my legs cramp up. I couldn't handle it. All right. So that, that pretty much wraps up Acts 16, 16 through 40. Um, took about 55 minutes to run through it. That's that pretty decent. An hour, yeah. Yeah. That's not bad. We wanted to keep this down to around an hour. So um, now what we're going to be doing is, Random acts of study. So I think uh, maybe we, we say a quick prayer over what we've just done, uh, what we've just gone over, and uh, then we'll move on to our next reading for two weeks from now. Okay. You want me to pray? Sure. All right, let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this day you've given us, Lord. We thank you for your word that you've given to us, Lord. We thank you for the examples in your word, Father, that we can take, Lord. And we thank you for this opportunity we've taken to to do a random act of study here, Father, Lord. And if we've missed a point, Lord, may you bring it out out in our lives. Um, May you take the points that we've come up with, Lord, the the, the study we've come to, and um, help us to change our life to to a, a close relationship with you, to look at these examples that you've given to us, Lord, to follow and, Lord, that obedience to you is, is the most important things in our life, Father. And, Lord, I just pray as we uh, we open to another act of study, uh, Lord, that you uh, just bless us in this endeavor, Lord. For all in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So here we go. I'm going to uh, switch back over to cam view, and right. we're going to go... I'm going to go here. All right. So we go Judges or Ruth. It's Ruth and Judges. So yeah, my eye went straight to Ruth. Okay. But uh Well I think I think Where did yours go? Well there's no heading and judges since we normally do a section. This is where a random act of study and the way we, we kind of set this up is one of us flips it open and one of us picks, you know, okay, look down, what do you find? Right. You left me with one choice. <laughs> there really there's Ruth. only one choice to make. I mean there if we're gonna do a section, like, you know, okay, we'll see how far it is. I've only got one. There's there's only one. So we're going to start in the book of Ruth. And we're going to literally start in the book of Ruth. We're going to do Ruth 1, starting in verse 1, all the way to verse 13. Sounds good. All right. So now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. Oh, man, i got to do the names. And a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Mahalan and Chilion, Ephraphites of Bethlehem and Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives, with the names of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. 
and as they lived there about ten years, then both Mahalon and Chilion also died, and the women were bereft of her two children and her husband. So the woman was bereft. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the land of Moab. For she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was, and her two daughter-in-laws with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi, Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you and your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why would you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb, that I may be, that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a, to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they are grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. I'm going to keep going, actually. All right. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death departs parts you in me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. I think we should probably keep going. Okay, we'll just finish the chapter. Yeah, may as well. All right, so they both went until they came back to Bethlehem. And when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has witnessed against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned with her, Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Now that one's going to be a fun one to unpack because there's a lot of um, stuff happening, but not a lot of stuff happening. Yeah. So uh, that right there, uh, again, is kind of the beauty of the random acts of study. We are going to study on this, the context behind it, um, what exactly is going on, why it's happening. And we're going to have to read a little deeper into uh, Ruth to, to really find out, you know, what's, what's going on. Yeah, pretty sure we're going to end in chapter four. Yeah, so we're going to have a pretty long, uh, pretty long little uh, session next time. Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, study it yourself. Ruth is not long at all, so it's it's a very quick read. It's a very easy read. Um, it's literally four pages in my Bible, four chapters. Yeah. So study on with us. If you have any questions about uh, what we covered on Acts. 16, uh, 16 through 40, which is kind of what we ended up uh, running with. Um, technically, we could have started in, in 14 where it talks about Lydia, but we covered Lydia anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have any questions, comments, um, any insight that you have, get get onto the Facebook group and make a comment. You know, yeah. Open up a dialogue. Talk with us. Talk with the other listeners. You know, there, We have a, a hundred. Yeah. As of right now, we might have more by the time this goes into podcast. Um, and that's not counting uh, Instagram. Yeah, yeah we have more than Instagram, yeah. which I need to post more on Instagram. I'm yeah, I got yeah, like eight there, but that puts us over 100, 108 or something like that. Yeah, that's not bad. I'll not take bad it. At all. I'll take it. People that want to know the Word of God a little bit better, like us. Um, so, like I said, um, I make no apologies for where uh, my finger took us into, uh, you know, the the Word of God. Uh, Ruth, like like we said, it's going to be a bit difficult. I um, saw you going for somewhere in the beginning there. Thank God you didn't get a Leviticus because that, that's going to happen one day. <laughs> it will, yeah. I'll take Ruth. Um, yeah, I'll take Ruth, and I will make no apologies when we do get Leviticus. 
It'll, it'll be in the Lord's time, but it wasn't today. Amen, to, God. That. Amen to that. Yes. Um, so that pretty much wraps up. Um, that episode, wraps up for now. Yeah, episode we'll, three. We'll be back live in two weeks. Sounds good. I look forward to it. Everybody, be sure to study and uh, open your Bible daily. If you have kids, pray with them. If you don't have kids, pray with your, your spouse or and your if partner. You have, if you have kids, open, open the Bible with them. You, yeah. You'd be surprised what they come up with. Uh, yeah. Have them randomly open it. Uh, Although they'll have some good questions for you sometimes. And goodness knows you need to be prepared for it. So uh, with that, I, I guess we're going to see ourselves off and we'll see you pretty soon. Two weeks. Bye, guys. <laughs>